In this episode of Train Spotting, Steve visits the Kentonese Sussex to see a genuine light railway in action, whilst I'm given a tour of Bombardier's factory in Derby to see how a modern train is put together. Steve gets to see just how good a train journey can be on the ICE 3 in Germany, and I feel a song coming on over the trials and tribulations of the singer Percy French and the West Clare Railway. For over 160 years, Derby has been at the centre of development and manufacturing of rolling stock and locos in the UK. But it's not just a history of manufacturing, there's also a history of testing and research. And with a skilled workforce and a host of ancillary companies in the area, it was only sensible that when Bombardier were looking for an outlet in the UK, Derby was their choice. Martin Bright, you're the Technical Services Director for Bombardier here in Derby. There's yes. been there's quite a lot of heritage and history that goes with these works, isn't there? Yeah, we've been building rail vehicles on this site since 1839. Uh, originally carriages and wagons, but now a much more modern product like these two Electrostar trains here. Now, I'd love to see one of these Electrostars being built from scratch, because I travel on one of these to work every day. OK, I think the first thing we ought to do, then, is start off in the car body construction area. Uh, the, the area is split into three uh, stages. What we've got here is the uh, underframe assembly area. In the centre of the facility is the roof assembly, and at the north end, uh, the body side assembly. So basically, a, a carriage starts like this. It starts here, yeah, with these extrusions delivered into us from our extrusion subcontractor. We then load these extrusions into the underframe main fixture here, clean them, and weld them together. From the construction area, the individual body panels are transferred to the paint shop, where they are spray finished. Then they're taken to begin their journey down the giant assembly hall. This is the, uh, the body side stage, which is the, which is the first stage in one of the four main assembly areas. Uh, the body sides have been loaded into the fixture, and we're about to start fitting window units, which are glued into position. Once that is complete, the interior panels will be fitted out prior to these body sides being moved down the shop and erected into a, a final car. Each of the production lines has five vehicles in production at any one time. Here's a roof which I presume has now been finished. Yeah, this is a, a completed roof. Um, it's still sitting in its fixture. The fixture actually allows us to rotate the roof through 360 degrees, so it's always in the right position for the assembly people to work in. Next to the roof, an upside-down floor panel was having all the necessary wiring, pipes and fixtures fitted that make it ready to receive the modules for power, plumbing, air conditioning and lighting. Once complete, it is moved on down the line to be joined to the two side panels. Now this is beginning to look more like a carriage. What stage are we at now? Uh, we're at the erection stage. What's happening in here is that the underframe has been located into the fixture uh, the body sides have been moved down from the body side stage and are located on the yellow reference fixtures. Mm -hmm. We're currently waiting for the roof to come down. Once that's located in position, the vehicle is hook bolted together. So this is where the doors are fitted. How's it done? We, we fit the door location fixture into the door aperture first, which allows us to mount the header gear in the same position every time. And the doors are hung on the, the rails at the top and located onto the rollers at the bottom. In an adjacent workshop, the cab units were being assembled. The complicated mouldings for these are the only piece of bodywork that are made outside the plant, as it is more economical to do so. They arrive as empty shells, into which all the control and communication equipment is fitted. So this is one with the cab on it. So what's the, the final process of the, uh, the construction, is it? The, the, the vehicle's currently standing in the traction and interior fit-out stage. So what we do here is we fit all the heavy underframe equipment, that's traction equipment, brake equipment, uh, toilet tanks. So the, the only thing, once it leaves this stage left, is bogeying, fitting of seats, and general cleaning of the car.
So here we are then, a, a brand spanking new Electrostar. What's it doing here at the moment? Uh, we're, we're actually on the dispatch line at the moment. Uh, so the train is having its exterior decals applied. Uh, any final touch-ups on the paint done uh, and the interior clean. Well, it's a lovely interior. You've got a very bright, airy, light, comfortable-looking uh, carriage here, Martin. And just yeah. to think that this morning when we saw those aluminium extrusions, we've managed to make a whole Electrostar. How many of these do you have on order? This particular version of Electrostar, we're building 228 cars. That's 57 four-car trains. We have a current order book that uh, lasts in excess of uh, 10 years. So you're going to continue and carry on that tradition here in Definitely. Derby? Definitely. Derby will continue as a rail manufacturing plant. Colonel Holman Fred Stevens has entered the annals of railway history as the pioneer of light railways. In a 40-year career around the turn of the century, he was responsible for building or managing 16 such lines, the best preserved of which is the Kent and East Sussex Railway at Tenterden. Here, a small but extensive museum has been built in his honour. Brian Jaynes showed me round. Here we have a, a, a very well presented museum and we've been collecting artefacts for 30 years and we show the story of Stevens from his family history right the way through panels for each of his railways and we try and demonstrate to people what a light railway might have looked like. So plenty of uh, exhibits to see. What about the, the bits and pieces that you managed to get out of some of the railways? Oh, some fascinating stuff. I mean, we have a complete recreation here of his, his office and of the railways we have posters and timetables uh, name plates, tickets. And what was it that attracted him to, to the light railway side of things? Well, at, at the turn of the century, people really wanted, in rural areas, really wanted transport communications. Uh, and it was really, if you're off the main railway system, you were off the map. So they wanted cheap railways built there, and he was a leading advocate of the best ways of building cheap railways. And uh, what kind of railways did he build? The principal railways were here uh, on the Kent and East Sussex. There was a railway, another railway in Kent, the East Kent. There was one at uh, Chichester, the Selsey Railway, uh, and the Shropshire and Montgomery Shire in, uh, on, the, on the Welsh borders. And over in Wales, he ran uh, railways like the Festiniog and the Welsh Highland, which are still preserved to die. And what was he like as a man? We think of him a bit of an eccentric now. Was he thought of in, that, in those days like that? Oh, no, no. He's a very, very much part of the establishment. A very military bearing, very much a patrician figure. So he had a lot of influence and, uh, and he was by, uh, by no means regarded uh, by his contemporaries as eccentric. say, Brian, that the Kent and East Sussex was the uh, Colonel's real favourite, wasn't it? Yes, it was. It was the first real standard gauge light railway that he'd built, and he was very fond of it throughout his life. Um, this station here was built in 1905, and he used techniques in here to build an economical station building, which uh, he wanted to try out, basically. And what locos and rolling stock can we see here today, then? Well, one of our trains running today will be a corridor stop, which is much more comfortable for our passengers, and that will be pulled by an a standard austerity class. Um, but the other train we're running today was, will be a, a Terrier, which is 32678, uh, ran here from the mid-30s onwards, and that's one of the Colonel's favourite engines. Well, rural this certainly is, isn't it? This is what it's all about, I guess. Yeah, this is it. We're serving out here serving the agricultural community. And you can see all around us, you know, it's very wild fields and prosperous agriculturally. There are many hop fields over there. And this is what these railways were built for. They weren't built for uh, moving people, they were built for moving goods in and out to the farming community. Um, so, you know, we're surrounded here by typically uh, Kent countryside on the fringes of the Romney Marsh. And what little differences could we see on the line today that shows it in its light railway form? Well, you, you, you probably notice we're going up and down quite a lot. I mean, that would be typical. You wouldn't level out the land particularly. And of course, you've got, you had light track and you had the very small engine. That's why terriers were particularly popular uh, on light railways because they're very light axle load and the wear and tear on the uh, track was not so much. In the 
old days when we crossed there were crossings and many many of them didn't have gates for instance uh, they would have just had cattle grids but we've had to put gates on uh, in for modern traffic conditions but they're certainly not automated we actually have to get out open the gates drive the train through shut the gates and carry on again um, typically like railway practice and it's something we like to preserve And it's not just the general makeup of the track and everything. The stations are a, a, a cheaper version, really, of what other stations were. Bodium's a good example of that, isn't it? Absolutely right. Yes, built cheaply with corrugated iron, but it has a few basic facilities. You, you have your passenger waiting area, and you have your area for the goods, the parcels office, and very basic uh, amenities. I mean, the, the toilets were flushed by water from the roof, for instance, right. uh, which may get a bit aromatic in uh, in summer, but served its purpose because there was no running water, no electricity. These are deeply rural areas. They served a purpose. They came, they went. You've preserved it. How do you think the Colonel would think about how you're running the railway today? We like to think we run an ideal light railway that he would very much approve of. Uh, we do not approve of the ramshackled approach uh, that you can get, and some people think of Colonel Stevens as ramshackled. He was not. He was a pioneer of model light railways, and that is what we aim to achieve here. A visit to Cologne in the industrial heartland of Germany with its magnificent Gothic cathedral provided us with the opportunity to take a look at the state of the railways in one of our largest continental neighbours. Cologne Station is one of the busiest and most important interchanges in Europe. It was originally built in 1859 and has benefited from a major refurbishment completed in 2000. 1,200 trains and over 200,000 people pass through it every day and the services they use are divided into four main categories. Firstly, the S-Bahn, or urban service, provides a metro-style network throughout the city and its outskirts. The RB, or regional barn, is the equivalent to our stopping service, or commuter trains. These are obviously very busy during the two daily peak periods. The RE, or regional express, provides a faster service, stopping only at major towns and cities. Some of the trains that are used here have these rather smart double-decker coaches built by Bombardier. And 95% of the network in Germany is electrified using high-voltage overhead catenaries. But the trains that really catch the eye are the distinctive ICEs. These not only provide an intercity service throughout Germany, but also run across most of Europe. And whilst we were here, an arrival from Brussels was coupled to one from Hamburg before leaving for Milan. At Cologne, you really get the feeling of being very much at the hub of a busy European network. The ICE fleet has undergone a number of improvements since it was launched in 1991, and the tilting trains that form the ICE2 fleet have recently been superseded. And that's why I've come to Cologne, to take a ride on this beast down to Frankfurt. It's the latest generation of the ICE trains. It's the ICE3, and with speeds of over 200 miles an hour, it's currently the fastest passenger train in Europe. Well, we're accelerating up to our top speed soon of uh, about 300 kilometers an hour, just over 200 miles an hour. That's fast. At those speeds, you'd expect a bit of movement. Not so. Really comfortable. It's a nice open feel. If I want to know where I'm going, all I need to do is look up at the onboard passenger display. It tells me how fast I'm going and how quickly I'm getting to my next destination. All the traction equipment and the modular systems, they're under the train, which means that this carriage is built purely for the passenger. Onboard entertainment, six audio channels down here that you can listen to during the journey. Something for everyone. But if you think this is good, check out First Class. All the interior fittings are of a very high standard of modern design. A dining car provides a range of meals. Private business areas are available, as indeed are mother and toddler rooms. The tilting ICE2s were run on the original Cologne to Frankfurt line that follows the winding course of the Rhine. For the ICE3s, a new high-speed line has been built that cuts its way in a direct route across the countryside using many tunnels and bridges. 
This enables the train to achieve its top speeds without needing to tilt. The journey time from Cologne to Frankfurt has been cut from two hours down to just over an hour, and the plan is to extend a network of these high-speed lines across the whole of Europe. Just come out of a tunnel, and normally as you go into a tunnel, a bit of a whoosh in the ear. No such problem on the IC train. There it goes again, but nothing, because the cabins are pressurised. No discomfort to the passenger at all. Apart from that, it's just a very, very pleasurable experience. Very comfortable, and really just a pleasure to be on. So how about this? This is the chance to get a driver's eye view from an ICE train. You can sit here, you can see what the driver sees. It really is a wonderful, wonderful innovation. And on top of that, if he doesn't want you to see what he's seeing, he'd actually make it opaque. But while he doesn't, this really is the best view on the train. Instead of travelling into Frankfurt city centre, I had arranged to get off at the stunning new station at the airport. Designed by the architects BRT of Hamburg and opened in 1999, this uses glass and steel to create an open, bright and very high-tech transport interchange. Well, this really is a fitting place for us to end our journey on the IC3. This one continues its journey on to Baal. The ride, exhilarating. And unless I take up Formula One, this is likely to be the fastest I'll ever travel across land. On the 10th of August, 1896, the famous Irish entertainer, singer and raconteur, Percy French, was booked to play the Moors Hotel in Kilkee. He travelled on the mainline service from Dublin and then had to transfer across to the West Clare Railway, where he caught the 1300 from Ennis to Kilkee. Everything was going swimmingly. The train was on schedule to arrive at Kilkee at half past three that afternoon. But then the driver noticed something wrong with the loco, and the train stopped just outside Milltown Malbay. Is there some sort of a problem? I don't know. I just got to check it out. After a short consultation with the driver, the guard, a certain Michael Talty, informed the passengers that there would be a slight delay. Is there, um, is there some sort of a problem? Uh, I don't know, but it looks pretty serious. I've got an interview to do. They're waiting for me. How long are we going to be? Uh, sorry, I've got no idea. Eventually, they got the train going again, and a rather irate Percy French finally arrived at his destination at half past seven, four hours late. Where is he? Oh, he's gone wild. Joe Taylor, you're one of the founding members of the preserved West Clare Railway. How did the Percy French story end? Well, it ended when, after he arrived in Kilkee, his concert was cancelled. So um, he sued the West Clare Railway Company for loss of earnings and lack of performance or whatever was in it. And he was awarded eight pounds, nine shillings and sixpence at the local court. So then he wrote a song about it. Are you right there, Michael? Are you right? Which was lampooning the thing that let him down, you see. And the company took exception to this. So they appealed the decision. At the hearing of the appeal at Kilkee Assizes, some weeks afterwards, when the case was called at half ten, there was no sign of Mr. French. So he came in three quarters of an hour late and the judge reprimanded him, Mr. French. He said, you better have a good excuse. So he apologised to the court, French did, and uh, he said, I'm sorry, your lordship, he says, I'm late for your court. But he said, I came here by the West Clare Railway, he says, and it was late again. <laughs> and did he win? Absolutely. <laughs> he was allowed to keep his eight pounds, nine shillings and sixpence. It's a, uh, quite a famous song, and can you sing it for us? Yeah, well, no, I wouldn't be great at singing. I'm, as a friend of mine says, I'm like a crow shouting into a bucket. But we will get somebody that will do it for you before the evening is out, Mark. Right, OK. Now, where did the, the line run from to? The line ran from, as the song goes, from Ennis as far as Kilkee. So it was a 53-mile-long narrow-gauge rail line. But unfortunately, due to immigration in a depressed decade of the 50s, it didn't prove successful. So they closed it some years in 1961. It was the last narrow-gauge to close in the country. The finance and a lot of the energy behind the railway's recent revival has come from local businessman Jackie Whelan. 
So Jackie, when did you first come to the West Clare Railway? Uh, 96. And what state was it in when you arrived? Completely overgrown, uh, briars and trees and shrub and uh, long grass and you name it. You've got a lot of track heading up towards Ennis. Um, how far do you want to go in that direction? Well, we want to go three and a half miles actually here from the platform. That takes us into a, a big 300 acre lake and stock the lake with fish and I could stay there for a couple of hours if I wanted. I could pick up a packed lunch here, still put on the lake, fishing, and come back on whatever train the lake in the evening. Because the engine you've got at the moment, it's a, it's a diesel engine, isn't it? The diesel engine we have at the minute. Uh, it's a modern engine. It's 170 horsepower. So it's a very powerful little engine. And have you got a steam engine here as well? Well, we have. We have uh, one of the original steam engines in 1892, built by Dubs and Lesko originally, a um, German engineer, and 36 tonne weight and it's in Ross and Wye presently being rebuilt. It was named after our local mountain here, Mount Callan, and it will be back in the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Dublin 2005. Now this Percy French song, I've heard so much about it, could you give us a few bars of it? Well, no, I wouldn't be into singing, but if you come call to the railway bar tonight, uh, I'll get the Percy French song on high notes here. sitting in the train of course, I couldn't resist Jackie's advice and later that evening popped down to the Railway Tavern in Ennis, where despite his protestations of modesty, who should be leading the singing but Joe Taylor himself. Oh, it all depends on whether your engine holds together and it might, now Michael, so it might, so it might, and it might, now Michael, so it might. Well, it looks like you had an absolutely fantastic time in Ireland then. Oh, yeah, yeah. After we finished filming in that pub, carried on drinking and chatting and we had a really good crack. Yeah, those are the black stuff, I bet. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah some really funny moments and I've got some very fond memories. Just that... You I can't, can't remember, remember them. them. The lads are back next Friday at the same time, 8 o'clock. But next tonight, Tommy Walsh makes it big. Have you entered today's Christmas competition yet? Well, there's a mystery prize up for grabs for digital satellite viewers if you press red now. <laughs>